All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, this afternoon, we're discussing trans feminine cyberpunk futures uh, with editor Anne LeBlanc and three contributors to Embodied Exegesis, a new anthology from uh, Neon Hemlock Press. Firestorm is a 16 year old uh, radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective uh, in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And uh, our collective strives to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to book virtual events like this one, uh, because we know that um, kind of online content expands the range of who can participate and uh, overcomes barriers for many people in our community. And we've got some exciting events on tap uh, that are virtual over the next month after taking a little hurricane related pause. Um, we've got uh, a conversation with former political prisoners and hacktivists, Jason and Jeremy Hammond um, on November 9th. So maybe a good cyberpunk follow-up to today. Uh, and we've also got a discussion about movement and migration in Appalachia, um, which is a reschedule. And that'll be happening on November 18th. Uh, you can find both of those uh, on our calendar online. So tonight we are using um, Zoom's uh, webinar uh, feature, which includes a Q&A tool where you can submit questions. There's also an open chat that you're welcome to use. Um, but please do drop questions into that Q&A tool so that we can keep track of them and they don't get buried. I know that Anne is planning to um, do a little Q&A at the end of the, the conversation. Um, so we really wanna hear from you and uh, appreciate you just writing those questions out as we go rather than waiting until the very end so that we've kind of got uh, a queue of them to, to work with. Okay, great. So we're gonna get started. Oh, I don't think I held up the book. It's got a beautiful cover, so don't miss. Um, so quick bios for uh, our panelists tonight. Um, Anne LeBlanc is a writer, editor, and woodworker um, calling in from a woodworking studio. This is the most legit bio. I, I, I love it. Uh, her stories have been published in Strange Horizons, uh, Clark's Wood, Escape Pod, and Baffling Magazine. Uh, her debut uh, novella, The Transitive Properties of Cheese, uh, which I am remiss to not have in front of me, but we do have copies in the store, uh, is now out also from Neon Hemlock, Hemlock Press, also with a great cover. Uh, Ellie Bangs uh, lives in Seattle, uh, where she fixes machines and rides her bicycle. Her apocalyptic cyberpunk collective consciousness novel, Unity, uh, can be found wherever books are sold, including Firestorm's website. And uh, her short fiction has appeared in Lightspeed Press, Clarkswood Magazine, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, and elsewhere. Uh, Catherine Kim is a transgender Korean-Canadian writer studying in the United States. Her work can be found in Black Warrior Review, uh, Fairy Tale Review, The Transcendent Series, uh, The Nameless Woman Anthology, and elsewhere. Her writing has been awarded the Francis Mason Harris 26 Prize, shortlisted for the Sunbur uh, Sunburst Award, and nominated for the Pushcart Prize. She earned an MFA at Brown University and is currently a PhD student at the University of Denver. Thanks so much for being with us, Catherine. And last but not least, uh, Petra Skelton is a non-binary trans femme who enjoys designing tabletop role-playing games, building and painting miniatures and writing zines and other fiction. She enjoys exploring body horror, mecha, and a whole host of other weird themes. Uh, her latest project is Bellum Arcana, a tarot-based tabletop role-playing game about revenge and the secret war to claim it, which we should definitely do an event just about that. Um, so thank you so much for being here, Petra. And I'm going to drop some links uh, in the chat for folks, including uh, a link to the book uh, tonight, in case you haven't already bought one, and also the personal websites for our panelists. Um, really appreciate you all making time to be here. Um, and Anne, thanks so much for uh, kind of facilitating the conversation tonight. I'm going to pass off to you. So hi, yeah, I'm Anne LeBlanc. Uh, I edited uh, embodied exegesis, which has this beautiful cover by uh, Liz Minold. They did an absolutely fantastic job. Um, and so I, I put this anthology together because I, um, 
you know, I knew that there was a ton of really cool experimental and weird uh, science fiction being put out by uh, Transfem authors, uh, and I wanted to collect it all in one place. And um, cyberpunk was kind of a natural genre um, for that approach, just because of you know tra uh, trans women's contribute contributions to computer science, um, stuff like um, The Matrix, Wendy Carlos. Um, who wrote the the um, uh, the soundtrack for Tron? Um, and I feel like uh, cyberpunk is a natural um, genre to talk about um, the bot, the intersection of the body and technology. Um, and so we've got a lot of stories with kind of your traditional cyberpunk with implants and um, powerful corporations, but with kind of a, a trans uh, focus on them. But we've also got um, a lot of like weird bodies you might not have seen in cyberpunk before. Uh, we've got a story about what if your mom was a Twitch streamer and had an army of toxic fans, half of whom are bots. Um, we've got a bunch of hive mind stories, uh, including the sequel to uh, Haley Piper's award-winning uh, book, Queen of Teeth. Um, we've got bullets made of uh, compacted and weaponized cringe. Um, we've got a transgender coffee maker. Uh, in a space fleet trying to arrest God by Maya Dean, author of Wrath Gotta Sing. Um, and we have three awesome stories by Ellie Bangs, Catherine Kim, uh, and Petra Skelton, each of whom is going to do a little reading tonight. Uh, and then once the readings are over, we'll do a uh, panel discussion with audience questions at the end. And I also just I want before we get into the readings, I want to thank um, Firestorm Books so much for putting on this event. Um, you know, they've been through a lot, the whole Asheville and, and Appalachian community has been through a lot with Hurricane uh, Helene. Um, so any way that you can support them, buy books through from them would be awesome. Um, you know, they also uh, said that donations to uh, mutual aid disaster relief uh, would be appreciated. So if you have, you know, spare money and want to help out with the, 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 re the relief efforts uh, in the area, that would be awesome. Uh, and there's a link in the chat now to mutual aid disaster relief. Um, so let's uh, get started with the readings. I think Ellie Bang volunteers to go first. Thank you, Ellie. Um, and yeah, go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm going to be reading just the first uh, scene of my short story that appears in this anthology. It is titled Bespoke. The awards ceremony was a monumental exhibition of the world's most daring and sumptuous masterworks of skin. And in that way, there was nothing else like it. Limousines landed with silent grace and opened to unveil bodies crafted by all the greatest living artists, sometimes over the course of years. Faces, hands, wings, tentacles, trunks, and feelers engineered cell by cell for the sake of this one evening never before seen and likely never to be seen again. Unfortunately for mortal, the awards was also a massive social spectacle where the insufferably rich and famous congregated to bask in the spotlights and gossip behind each other's backs. Mortal would have preferred to watch a broadcast, but it was always framed for a presumptive mass audience that had no eye for the art. It lingered on the smiles and waves, the displays of affection, on who was involved with who and how it was going. Mortal needed to study the gates in detail, the mannerisms, the microscopically subtle cues that revealed how it felt to be those marvelous bespoke bodies. For that, they had to be here in person for as long as they could stand it. Is that, someone behind them said, who, someone else replied, that's them, that's Mortal, the body maker. Mortal cursed under their breath. They'd picked the darkest and most secluded corner of the gallery and they'd still been recognized almost immediately. They took a cocktail from a passing tray without turning. But they look so understated, I know, it's essential to their mystique. They're very reclusive too, aren't they? Mortal studiously ignored the chattering socialites as a celebrated musician stepped onto the red carpet wearing what Mortal instantly thought was the finest work yet by its artist. 
a four-armed humanoid body whose entire surface was covered in retractable scales, allowing her to retile herself from porcelain white to blood red. Body makers had been doing similar things with chromatophores for years, but this felt like the apotheosis of that entire subgenre of skin. And Mortal had heard that each scale, despite its toughness, was sensitive to sound. They would have given anything to see her perform music in that body, an instrument in each hand while sonic waves washed visibly over her. But that can't be what Mortal really looks like. The socialites continued. I mean, you know what I mean. Surely an artist of their stature doesn't actually live in a body so plain. No one knows. The real body must be incredible. Mortal repressed a growing itch to speak up and tell the chatterers to go away, or worse, tell them the truth. That their body, short and slight, pale and unremarkably genderless, was the same they lived in since birth, without modification. No one would believe it. In these circles, it was like wearing a paper bag over their head. They told themselves they only needed to hold out a little, little longer. They couldn't leave without seeing Finch. A famous experimental dancer made an entrance that perplexed mortal at first, but then awed them. A parade of seven freestanding bodies that mirrored each other's moves, each one representing the performer at a different stage of his life. Could he feel with all of them at once? Could he control them independently? That would be a revelation. But the socialites were unimpressed. Mm, too cookie for my tastes. Oh, yes, now that you mention it, terribly cookie. Mortal wanted to scream. To call a body cookie was both the laziest and most scathing, scathing insult nowadays. They had come of age at the height of what everyone now retroactively called the cookie cutter years. The grim decades after interbody consciousness transfer had matured technologically, but before it exited its cultural infancy. Years when mainstream artists did nothing but manufacture nearly identical super people according to conventional beauty standards and offered them in only the two then mainstream genders. Artists like Mortal had been edgy freaks back then, rather than the respected avant-garde they were now, and although Mortal hardly missed the cookie cutter years overall, they missed the obscurity. Besides which, these spectators were just objectively wrong. Each body in the performer's gestalt had visible pores and scars. The unadorned humanity wasn't forced, but earnest and quite vulnerable. Supposedly, the chatterers continued, if you compare old videos, you can see mortal aging, you know, with wrinkles. Are you saying mortal is actually, well, mortal, unthinkable? Oh, it's a decades-long work of extreme performance art. As a rule, nobody but religious zealots died of old age anymore, but at times like this, mortal couldn't deny the appeal. They downed the last of their drink and accidentally dropped it on the floor. They felt sick, but they couldn't leave yet. And there, at last, was mortal's own latest piece worn by an up-and-coming immersive actor named Finch. It had taken months of interviews to see past Finch's stardom and the bravado of the characters he played to a surprisingly sensitive man, repressed and yearning to be more open. The body mortal had engineered for him was soft and graceful with very long arms and fingers. Its blood ran warm enough to need no clothes but a tasteful loincloth, and its nacreous skin was laced with emotionally responsive bioluminescence so that even a talented actor wouldn't be able to school his expressions. It had been a risk. There had been no way to know how that much emotive nakedness would feel here and now. But one look told mortal it was perfect. They could feel Finch's radiant pleasure in himself filling the entrance hall, drawing a sigh of vicarious euphoria through mortal's chest. Every step was a dance. Every forced smile remained matte, while every genuine one shimmered. And when Finch's eyes looked up to search the gallery and found mortal, he flashed from face to fingertips to toes. 
mortal's heart soared. One of the socialites munched on an hors d'oeuvre and announced through a full mouth, I don't get it. It's not the body, it's the brand, said another. Everyone on that carpet dreams of wearing mortal. Only a handful have the cash. Oh, not just the cash, connections. Sila tried to commission a body from mortal for their big stage tour last year. They turned her down. Sila, that's how connected you have to be. Mortal found another cocktail and swallowed it in an unbroken series of gulps. When they finally turned to leave, they were cornered. Any comment on the auction? Eyes of varying sizes and spectral ranges ran up the paparazzo's forehead and down his cheeks wide and wet. Nobody needed that many eyes just to record video. The guy probably got a kick out of making people feel like flies under the gaze of a giant spider. Never heard of it, Mortal muttered, shoving roughly past him, but the paparazzo shouted down the stairs after them. You didn't hear? That body you made for Finch, the winning bid, just came through. It's going to the Crown Prince of Florida right after the awards. Mortal squinted in disbelief. Everyone knew the kinds of bodies the prince wore, graceless effigies of an imagined masculinity that had never existed, so leathery they must have been numb. That kind of mind became dysphoric in any body that could bench press less than 500 kilos. I don't think it will fit him, Mortal said. The paparazzo only laughed. <laughs> it's not like he's going to wear it. The alcohol hit Mortal's stomach all at once. They had told Finch their policy. They'd explained to him the hurt exactly this kind of betrayal had caused. They trusted him as deeply as he'd seemed to trust them, and still Finch wasn't keeping the masterwork of somatic euphoria Mortal had spent two years painstakingly tailoring to his mind. It wasn't even going to be cremated, which would have at least offered closure. It was going to be pickled in preservative and exhibited like a hunting trophy in a Floridian palace. All its care and artistry boiled down to a cruel spectacle of wealth. I quit, Mortal heard themselves say as the stairs darkened and gyrated around them. I'm done. I've made my last body for these people. The paparazzo's eyes all bulged. What? Say that again. I need to hear that for the record. I said the body maker began and vomited. Uh, and from there it it proceeds. Um, and I hope you will buy this awesome anthology and maybe find out where it goes. Yeah, thank you, Ellie. Yeah, one thing I love about your story is, you know, first, just like all the like insanely creative, you know, bodies that you describe in this. Um, but also just, you know, when I was first reading it, I was struck by how it did not go in the direction I was expecting. Um, and the ending, you know, just the the second or the, the, the rest of it is just a fascinating exploration of kind of the... Um, the extremes of, of dysphoria and like, I don't know, it's just such a good story. Um, so thank you so much for sending it to me. Um, all right, uh, how about we do Catherine next? Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I'll just be reading from, uh, from the start. Shortly before her transfer overseas, I heard back from Eve, who called to thank me for my hard copy of Paradise Lost, promising to read it during her flight. My gift reminded her of our old haunt in the basement of the university library, which she'd occasioned to visit on her final tour of campus. The archives are finally being digitized, she said, and the study rooms behind the stacks had been blocked off. But even from outside the cordon, she turned to commiserate with me aloud, by some unsurfaced habit expecting me by her side, only to realize, with the dust stirred awake by her passage, the distance of our years apart. She was making a list, she exclaimed, before I could respond to her sentiment, a list of memory places around the city she wished to revisit before her departure. 
Already, she'd been to the convenience store by our high school for a bag of shrimp crackers and to the cafe in the botanic park for a table overlooking the waterfall. Though the storefronts had changed, the new blossoms surrounded the pond, with even the tired evergreens uprooted for fresh saplings and brighter fronds. As Eve described these places, she sent me packets of the sense data she'd gathered in her travels, from the salt smoke of the fish cake stalls at the night market to the glimmer of small change at the bottom of the underground fountain at Silkworm Station. And I realized they were, they were all, these were all places we'd been together in our halcyon days, like keepsakes from a resurrected lifetime. Returning from one of these outings, she passed by my old apartment complex where she'd found a hot dog vendor set up under the same street light where we used to meet as kids. It seemed as if, Eve said, despite all the years gone by, no time had passed at all within the circumference of that light, flickering at the intersection between the brutalist remains of the old city and the black glass of the new. And when she described turning to offer me the last bite of her sweet pancake, I could taste the hot syrup on her thumb feel the static of the wind nipping at my exposed skin. And I knew, uh, despite my better judgment, that I had to see her again in the flesh. Sorry, I think my light went off. Um, okay. The next morning, I boarded the train to Museum Station, heading to the last stop on Eve's itinerary. I was thinking about the circumstances behind our separation her lipstick on the rim of my paper cup, the empty seat beside my hospital bed. When my wires crossed and the search results for Eden Research Team and Genesis Project crowded my vision of the passenger car. Even now, most of the results were related to the hearings on the whistleblower report, including a clip of Eve addressing the investigative panel, her back straight and expression demure as she read from her prepared remarks, which appeared to the camera as thin white lines scrolling down her retinas. One video I hadn't watched before featured a familiar face. Dr. Michael, our old project supervisor and Eve's mentor at the university. A news program on the Ministry of Culture's upcoming installation in the Peace District, which promised to reconstruct the activities of the dead in the hours before the city was shelled so that their simulacra might be glimpsed amidst the ruins by visitors tuned to the augmented reality layer on their optics. As Michael explained the technology behind the installation to the news desk, the video switched to a survivor of the bombings on a guided tour of her old neighborhood. The updated algorithm, Michael said, could bypass the nearly infinite operations it would take to simulate these details by their causal chains alone. And in the shadow of the empty tenement, the camera caught the moment the orphan turned away from the husk of her childhood home to see the ghost of her father returning from his morning walk after years of ash. Having arrived at Museum Station, I realized it was still too early to seek Eve at our rendezvous. Aimless, I wandered into a less trafficked corridor where the walls were textured with the overlapping impressions of human faces in the concrete. The display had been created, I read from its placard, using the faceplates of transhuman activists from the dark age of cybernetics, whose actions had frustrated the conglomerates seeking to integrate mass market implants into the city's digital panopticon. The replicas, the description noted, had been cast using the forensic scans saved in the city's police archives. Down this corridor, I saw a schoolboy bow his neck to fit his features inside one of these death masks. I thought back to the news program and how the orphan had looked when she turned to see her father once again, the telltale flicker of the simulation in her eyes, her facial prosthetic glitching into stillness at the inexpressible affect underneath it. And I wondered what grief would look like in Michael's vision of the future when we might summon the dead to our side with impossible fidelity and freely invite these ghosts to step out of their virtual afterlives into the solid world. I traced the impressions on the wall, 
feeling out where one's features bled into another's, some meeting at their mouth like lovers, others suggestive of conjoined twins, and the smear of a shapeshifter that, in their semblance of motion, wiped out their own details. Some of the activists, the placard informed me, had smiled for their mugshots, while others wept. Still others stared back lifelessly from the coroner's reports. Now all these gestures were petrified in concrete, though the molds forgot their tears, just like their teeth. Standing before these masks, I thought back to my work with Eve on the Genesis prototype years ago, the long nights that twist into mornings with a flick of the blinds. Awake, I'd pry Eve's tablet from her sleeping hands and correct the dream faults wandering about the dusk of her hypnagogic code. It was one such wanderer that came to mind, which I'd only discovered when I tasked the algorithm to render a simulation of ourselves. Partway through the simulation, we began to glitch, superimposed by other bodies who would act as we did, so that a stranger returned in my place with a thermos of black tea, and an ageless woman with synthetic features received it from me, a cyborg arm emerging from Eve's human limb, even as her organic hands kept busy with her work. And later that night, when Eve reached out to me, each new limb met another body conjoined to mine, each of different ages, sexes, and even species, from downy feathers to snake scales, so that it was only after a dozen hands had turned away as many hats that our lips found my own, while on the table our work flowered into a small garden of tessellations. I recognized one of these chimera cats as a junior coworker of ours, who'd been found on a park bench with a note in her jacket and her neural processor unplugged. The suicide's rich black curls in the throes of Eve's red lacquer grip. Looking into Eve's revisions in the code, I discovered that she'd tightened the algorithm's restrictions against examining its own programming, and these new rules were corrupting any simulations of its own history. Those directly implicated in the project's creation were the most transfigured by this kaleidoscope. A render of an evening long before our recruitment had Eve counting her affections for me on innumerable fingers, while the research team's briefing with the Ministry of the Interior depicted Michael as a biblical angel speaking to a supernatural beast here, his body alight with the pale fire of his conjoined ghosts. On the news program, our old supervisor had appeared unusually mortal, with a grave countenance embalmed by the harsh aging of his natural face. I thought of his explanation now, standing before the concrete chorus of the display, how the algorithm's capacity to wander and digress enabled it to make intuitive leaps, like the dream oracle weaving impossible associations into prophetic visions. But of course, he insisted, the algorithm could not so easily predict the future. It made sense to me, given what Michael had said. The glitch I discovered years ago was like a broken scene in the machine's lucid dream, through which I glimpsed some secret of its unconscious in the pale hours before its mending. On the other side of the deathly corridor, I visited a flower shop with a handwritten sign on its glass door, which promised to match its polyester blooms to the customer's desired scent. Feeling the fabric of a white rose petal with finger and thumb, I thought back to my convalescence after the surgery, and the flowers Eve had brought to my bedside. I'll leave off there. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Catherine. I, so when I uh, asked Catherine to be a part of the anthology, I, I was like, send me something, you know, you know, experimental or, you know, uh, very like in inventive structurally. And she absolutely delivered. Um, this is, one of the coolest stories I've ever read in terms of how many layers there are to it, how much it does with voice and um, just like how much it, like if you're interested in like really literary cyberpunk that demands a lot from the reader and has just like so much, so much richness to it, then this is absolutely the story for you. So thank you so much for sending me uh, this story. I'm so glad I got to include it in the anthology. Um, so let's, uh, let's go to Petra. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to be reading from my story from this anthology as well. Uh, the Missile Knows Where It Is. 
and I'll be reading the first segment of this. On target. I am on target, and of the focus, and of the aim. My arm is my arm, and I am a whole and perfect thing, pure of purpose, clear of morality, sworn to secrecy by means beyond my simple mind. I am my own world, rippling through the tissue paper reality that envelops my form. The mantra rolls around Aesop's mind as she moves through her morning stretches. It didn't matter that she was doing them all in her mind, that her limbs lacked the shape or structure required to assume downward dog, and that her absence of a spine rendered happy baby a mere thought experiment. Internally, she lies upon a mat made of foam, spring sunlight bleeding across softly tanned skin through blinds interrupted by a cat's morning wanderlust. If she looks to her right, Aesop might match eyes with her roommate, a young person with bright eyes and fluid gender. They both smile or giggle before resuming the morning routine, and Aesop would be ready to greet the day. That was before the job, before the opportunity of a lifetime. Five years of embodiment, guaranteed UBI. That was the government line. The corporate line was better worded, something that sold it instead of presenting it. The sort of line that passed through a table of hip young people with identities just radical enough to seem marketable, but tame enough to not offend any real authority in the room. They had colored hair, full tattoo sleeves, and pronoun pins, and he had five pending HR complaints. Be yourself. Be someone else for a blink. Be yourself for the rest of your life, was the line that had sold Aesop, back when deciding between HRT and rent was a quarterly concern, and groceries were always a result of good luck, swift hands, or charity. Her roommate had argued against it, citing concerns from across social media about the long-term effects of embodiment. Nothing says you'll even be you when you get out, Ace. They were leaning backwards in a chair, looking past their shoulder at Aesop, hands wrapped around their phone. On the screen, a feed of nightly panic and anxiety sits briefly frozen. Their features were difficult to see, a small cigarette burn in her mind's eye, making it impossible to look at them directly in the recollection. You're being dramatic. The pamphlet says reports of memory bleed are overblown and the risks are negligible at best. Aesop was reaching for the bedside propaganda, hoping that finally their partner might deign to read the damn thing themselves. Unfortunately, when Ace turned back to face them, their hands were currently engaged in wringing each other, leaving no room for the pamphlet. Frustrated but defeated, Ace squeezed the laminated paper a little tighter in her hands. Even now, in the recollection, Aesop can feel her fingers squeaking against the outermost layer of plastic. Sensation bleed is a common experience, especially when one lost themselves down to recollection, as Ace currently had. On target. I am on target, and of the focus, and of the aim. My arm is my arm, and I am a whole and perfect thing, pure of purpose, clear of, despite her best attempts, to wrest herself from the spiral, the moment is too damn compelling to watch from a place both within and without. The old desire to be right, and to know she was doing the right thing or had made the right decision was too much to deny. The confidence that she could fix it, as if anything was broken beside her compassionate listening, was infectious, drawing Aesop further and further down into her own memory. Come on, Ace, you can't believe... They rolled their eyes, and Aesop can feel their internal temperature skyrocketing from the sight. Her next words would be a little louder, tone sharper, as if punishing her partner for having a bog-standard reaction to corpo agitprop. 
What are the fucking options do I have, Shy? I apply to job after job, and none of them want me. Shy. Is that really their name? Why did it feel as though Aesop was hearing it for the very first time, then? That isn't the sort of thing you've just forgotten, yet it felt like Aesop had done exactly that. Sworn to secrecy by means beyond my simple mind, I am, unfortunately for her, and his realization is short-lived, as the recollection trucks onwards with an unstoppable momentum. No matter the effort, no matter the self-control she attempted to bring to bear through the mantra, this was happening. You got that call back last week. Shy's voice is quiet, the words themselves an obvious olive branch. Despite the unending hostility Aesop can feel pouring off of a body that had once been hers. It seems so obvious now, looking back at the moment through the rear view of her mind. Yeah, and the moment they heard my deep-ass baritone, they changed theirs real fucking quick. Ace's tone is... was bitter. Anger bleeding from her voice as though dripping from a shallow cut. The words are, were, wrong though. The woman before Aesop had a voice that sung in a deep contralto, the light vocal fry that crackled at the edges, only making her voice sound that much more lived in. You're just catastrophizing. Shy grounds her words of the gentle intimacy of touch, their strong hand resting upon her thigh as their eyes search for aces amidst her long mop of auburn hair own world. Am I? There were tears in Ace's voice, though her eyes remained dry. She hadn't looked up at her partner then, but Aesop can't remember why. Was she that afraid to be vulnerable around the one person that had seen her bleed more often than most? Shy was reaching out to them, both literally and figuratively, and it feels absurd to even consider that Ace might not have noticed in the moment. Have you watched any of those voice training videos I sent you? The question sent a tidal wave of shame through Ace, so intense that Aesop could feel it secondhand. Aesop can't remember what Shy's face looked like, but they can remember that they simply scrolled past every single one. Contrary to her complaints, she hadn't really wanted to fix anything about her voice. She just wanted Shy's support in a different, more specific way that she'd failed to specify. Oh my god. As Ace exclaimed and shame surges into anger, Aesop is startled to discover that as her recollected self looks up, she can finally see Shy's eyes. Beautiful blue-green irises widened from shock. Those little blue-green orbs softened for a moment, looking more like a deer staring down a gun barrel than one staring down a semi. I'm just saying. If you think it's a concern, why not spend some- Because I shouldn't have to fucking hide who I am anymore, Ace yelled, that supposedly deep voice of hers verging on shrill. Aesop felt shame again, but it was a new thing, untied to the recollection of themselves in any manner other than observation. Ripping through this tissue paper reality, please don't yell at me. Shy's voice was quiet now. A verbal flinch that made the recollected Ace stumble. She can tell she's fucked up, but for a moment it almost looks like the trans femme doesn't give a shit and might opt instead to double down. Instead, she looked away and pinches the bridge of her nose, seemingly frustrated by the harm she did. Fucking... Alright. Just... Can you trust me on this? I'll be fine. A lie. Ace was just embarrassed. Aesop remembers that much even without sympathetic e echoes. She'd felt like shit, all because of something she had escalated, and now she wanted to be comforted for a situation she created. I'm just scared, Ace. Shy's words are a quiet plea, and Aesop wonders now if that fear was of the situation or her. That envelopes my form. I know. Only a whisper, and Aesop finds the recollection fading. There had been conversations afterwards, but that was the one where she'd truly made up her mind. She was a failure, and she was tired of it. 
She was an emotional, expensive burden, and she'd only one chance to fix at least one of those issues. Plus, maybe the time with herself would help her rebalance or find perspective embodiment required. And I'll end there. Thank you, Petra. I, you know, one thing I, I, you know, love about this story is just the way that you play with point of view and tense to really like hammer home the kind of um, dysphoric uh, experience the main character is going through and, and the way that it lends itself to such a, a scathing critique of the way that the military industrial complex co-ops uh, queer bodies and, and, and queer uh, identities, uh, which feels very relevant to cyberpunk as a genre, um, which, you know, in the early, uh, you know, years of, of the genre in the, in the 80s had a much more countercultural um, bent to it. Um, and, you know, one of the criticisms these days of uh, cyberpunk is that it has been over aestheticized. It's, it's a pastiche of itself that focuses more on, you know, guys with big jackhammer arms, you know, fighting guys with can opener arms, and, you know, in a neon drenched cityscape and less uh, and getting away from you know fighting the man in in, in weird bodies um which is what i think the, the genre is at its best um so let's um dive into the the questions i've got prepared for y'all um first off i'm just curious so if we were living in the cyberpunk future and you could you know modify your body in any way possible um, what, uh, yeah, what would you, what kind of, what kind of cybernetic implants would you get? What would you do? I honestly, like a bunch of the uh, upgrades in Ellie's story, uh, the chromatophores and skin, that is literally a thing that I've wanted since I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's kind of my answer to I uh, have spent some time like anyone has marveling at uh, how cool cuttlefish are and how they can use their uh, full body color changing capabilities to communicate with each other and be expressive and I, I would love that. Although I, I think I also have a boring answer to that question, which is that I wish I could just have like a, a master switch installed that I could use to just like turn off my hearing completely. I just like, I'm pretty sensitive to sound and it seems like a huge like defect that we're forced to just hear every sound around us at all times when like we're trying to sleep or whatever. Um, so that'd be cool. <laughs> No, I'd love like cybernetics with like my like eyes, hearing, senses, whatever, except that um, I'm super paranoid and I'm the kind of person who uh, puts like a bit of a, a post-it paper over the laptop camera or whatever. So that's something I'll, I, I, that's a, something I never get, unfortunately. Yeah, I think, so I'm a, I'm a woodworker. I'm here in my woodworking shop um, and uh, you know, one of the problems with woodworking is you're always trying to like hold things in a very precise manner. So I would probably end up like the Futurama character clamps and just have like a bunch of, you know, clamp arms. Uh, you know, if I had like six arms all with a different like clamp on the end, that would be that would be ideal. Um, uh, all right. So Catherine and Petra, both of your stories have a sort of I don't know, like surreal, liminal, like a, a very blended point of view and voice where things, you know, like transition in a way that feels very, um, very natural, but also like almost kind of like, a, it, like it's like the prose is um, dysphoric in a way, uh, if that makes sense. I'm just curious if you can talk about your approach to voice and style for your story and how it connects to the deeper themes of your work. Um, I can take that question first. Um, the technology in uh, this, my story makes the, tries to make the narrative layers literal. So like 
when the narrator is remembering uh, memory, um, then it tries to, uh, for instance, uh, sorry, like when the narrator is watching a video, which is part of what I read from, um, it's playing before her eyes. And I wanted it to be indistinguishable in the text um, once that technology is set up for the reader uh, between when the characters are experiencing something in the augmented or virtual reality layer versus when they're thinking back to it or when they're sort of have like a flashback to it, um, imagining it or remembering it. Um, a lot of the story takes inspiration uh, from a very not cyberpunk uh, story, John Milton's Paradise Lost, an epic poem about um, Garden of Eden in the fall. And with this specifically, I'm looking at uh, two places. One place I'm looking at is uh, uh, Adam has this uh, flying dream um, where he first meets like God and sees the tree and has a taste of desire. Um, but when I think back to that section, the most noticeable thing about that section to me was that it was difficult or indistinguishable to tell what part was dream and what part was actual divine visitation. Or uh, later on in Eve's dream in the last book of the poem, uh, when they're being punished for uh, uh, falling into the trap that's been set up for them more or less, um, the uh, Michael, the Archangel Michael takes Adam up on a hill to receive all of these future visions of what's going to happen um, after they leave the Garden of Eden, um, except for Eve. Uh, Eve gets punished by um, Michael basically uh, dozing her with some magic eye medicine or something, and then she just falls asleep at the base of the hill and they leave her there. After um, uh, Michael gives Adam all of these instructions on these visions, He's like, now it's your turn to go to Eve and tell her all these things so that she'd be reassured and leave, uh, leave Eden. Um, except that when they get there, Eve is already awake, having dreamt everything. Um, not just the visions of uh, disaster and renewal, but also the sort of divine explanations for them. The line being, for God is also in sleep and dreams advise. Uh, so a, a kind of uh, sort of techno dreamscape was what I was going for in these sort of like memory devices, implants, optics, and stuff like that. And I hope that was reflected in the prose. Uh, yeah, damn. Um, my my answer is cringe. Um, <laughs> basically, I in my experience as a trans fam and no transition experience is universal but my experience with dysphoria especially later in transition is looking at yourself looking at the way the petty shitty ways you behave and realizing that not only were you actively hurting yourself but people around you were actively trying to help you and you struggle with that and i wanted i feel like when when I experience that in life, there is a blurring of you can start feeling your feelings about something that hasn't happened to you for years. And I wanted to instill that kind of like rhythm and momentum into it where it feels like a sinkhole. Like you're just, you've started thinking about this goodbye to the rest of your day, I guess. Like I wanted to go for kind of like that kinetic, uh, cringe feeling <laughs> yeah i think that's something that your story does really well is is that kind of jarring sense of like oh no i remembered this thing and now like <laughs> i'm in this bad place um and and i i loved your answer catherine um your story pairs really well with um another story um by uh coyote uh Dambiki. um that is a um uh it, it's a it, it also deals with um kind of the built environment and the way that the the cities in which we live in affect our our lives and our identities um but it's a riff on um uh, uh the the divine comedy um the the descent into into hell and and virgil and all that so it's it's very it's very cool to have those two things that have very different approaches to the same topic uh next to each other uh in the anthology um all right um next question 
Um, so Ellie and Petra, um, both of your stories deal with very inhuman bodies and kind of exploring the extremes of dysphoria experienced when moving to something unlike your original body. Dysphoria can be notoriously difficult to define or describe in exact detail, so I'm curious how you approach de depicting dysphoria uh, from a craft perspective. Uh, I can go first on this one if you want. Uh, I So there's a segment, I didn't get to it uh, in this reading, but there's a segment in, in uh, The Missile Knows Where It Is where uh, she has to select voice lines instead of just being able to speak. And I, that to me was like my, craft-wise, that's where I focused because I, I, I love the idea of you're so separate from yourself, but you've still had to sell a part of yourself. They have your voice, they managed to probably AI generate all of your of these things that you're saying that you never said. Um, and using that as your only mode of communication. Uh, and so, yeah, like uh, also using tense because every the tense keeps blending in the story. I, I don't know if I have a really smart um, way that I used, used it in a craft sense, but I, I feel like I learned a lot about what I myself think about dysphoria by writing this story and trying to kind of imagine um, I mean, it, you know, right now we have a kind of an, we have a really vague ability to speak about it um, or describe it even to ourselves, but we also have like, it, it's kind of a limited concept. I mean, it's something that was in the DSM until recently. It's like, we, we only have this narrow definition of like, if you feel this, there's something wrong with you. Um, where in, in reality, I think, everyone, if we really looked at it, probably everyone on earth experiences some version of gender dysphoria um, in particular contexts. And so I just tried to imagine um, a world in which that that's like really understood and documented and, and all the people in the story consider it the way that we might consider like iron levels or vitamin levels or, uh, you know, having a paper cut or something like it's, it's a very tangible, comprehensible thing um, in a way that it isn't in our present. Um, and I think I just tried to kind of roll that in in such a way that I didn't necessarily have to have comprehensive answers to all that questions and I didn't have to have that level of understanding myself but just the characters do yeah I think I think one of the best um depiction or descriptions of dysphoria uh, I, I've seen is actually uh, Morpheus's speech in the Matrix which uh you know, in which he talks about it as kind of this like invisible wrongness that you don't of, of the world that you don't even really notice until it's pointed out to you. Um, and, you know, uh, obviously the Matrix, people have talked about how it's an allegory for the trans experience. There's a great book on that um, by Tilly Bridges um, that you should check out. Um, I forget the title of it, but if you if you look up Tilly Bridges Matrix, you'll you'll find it. Um, so I'm curious, what have y'all uh, read recently uh, that y'all really enjoyed? Um, I had just recently read uh, Rika Aoki's Light from Uncommon Stars, and she also has a story in this anthology, um, and that that book completely blew me away. I, I was unprepared uh, to witness all the things that she manages to do in that story so amazingly, so. Yeah, yeah, that book is so good. It feels like one of those books that was written just for me because not only does it have like woodworking, Luthery, but it's also got just like gorgeous food writing and uh, like, you know, really insightful stuff about like food culture and like the trans experience and violin. Um, and yeah, I love her poem in, um, uh, in the anthology, The Wood Woman of Water Dreams, which was originally published um, in her poetry collection, uh, Why Dust Shall Never Settle on This Soul. 
um, which is really good. If you're, if you're into poetry, you should definitely check it out. Um, yeah. I've been reading uh, Yoko Ogawa's The Memory Police, uh, which was a fantastic book to read in the context of thinking about disappearing objects, thinking about memory work. It's a sort of uh, dystopian setting where um, the uh, regime has um, uh, made it possible to enforce the disappearance of certain things in our lives that begin with um, like certain objects, um, sometimes birds or books, and exploring the sort of like uh, uh, forced complicity of the population to expunge these memories and the objects of these memories. And I think that uh, something that reminded uh, me of this book uh, when reading from uh, this anthology is thinking of the, the, uh, the disembodiment work that uh, eventually, uh, spoiler alert, uh, body parts begin to be uh, enforced, their, their disappearances begin to be enforced. Um, and what that does to uh, the characters was really interesting. That sounds really good. I should check that out. What was the book again? Uh, the Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa. Okay, cool. Um, that reminds me a bit of um, a book I just read, um, The Fortunate Fall by Cameron Reed which is cyberpunk that was written in 96, but feels very, very relevant um, because it's all about how um, queerness is censored from the internet um, and gets into really interesting stuff with, um, you know, dysphoria and also a whale. Uh, so I, I would check that out. Uh, I've been rereading uh, a book recently, which is um, Manhunt by Gretchen Felker Martin, um, which I, I'm a huge body horror fan. This will always be one of my favorite things, but there's something about the book, uh, which is post-apocalyptic, but it, it turns uh, a visceral, emotional ugliness into its own landscape in a way that I find really, really intriguing. Because discussing and like flowing through the lines of dysphoria, trying to transition and control like struggle with masculinity in a, an apocalypse where masculinity literally turns you into a monster. Um, talking about all of that in such a way that isn't just, and also this is happening during a post-apocalypse, it's all through the whole thing. And I find uh, Gretchen's all of Gretchen's writing has kind of that uh, through line of kind of ugliness as a landscape, but I think Manhunt is a wonderful crystallization of it. And it's something that I'm rereading, trying to bring a little bit more of that into my work because I, I love how she can find the imperfect and really just find all the rough edges. It's great. That's a that's a great description of Manhunt. Yeah, one thing I, I, I thought that that book you know, I, I liked the through line of that book about the importance of um, uh, of, of trans community, uh, even amid the, the apocalypse. Um, some other books that I've read recently uh, that I enjoyed are um, These Fragile Graces, This Fugitive Heart by Izzy Wasserstein, um, which is some great um, cyberpunk. Um, one thing I thought was cool about that book is that it... Um, it really dug into what um, queer community looks like um, in kind of a uh, cyberpunk dystopian future. Um, her story in Embody Exodus also deals with um, uh, queer community. Um, a a uh, support group is a big part of it. Um, also themes of motherhood um, and um, nanites that don't quite get what uh, humans uh, want. Um, I also recently read um, the End Song series, the first two books of it by Sasha Stronach, which is like if um, if Disco Elysium was combined with um, uh, some of China Mieville's work. Um, it's it's very good, weird. Um, I don't even like genre, of, uh, you know, multiple genres all crammed into one. Um, and 
Yeah, I also want to plug one of the um, uh, anthologies that was an inspiration for Embodied Exegesis, uh, Meanwhile Elsewhere, um, which is um, science fiction um, stories written by um, trans authors. It was put out by Little Puss, or it was re-released by Little Puss Press. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really good. You should check that out. Um, all right. So I think we can get into some of the, uh, you know, uh, the questions. First one is from Wilfred. Um, what is a piece of cyberpunk media that you feel might have the greatest influence in your past, present, or future creations? Uh, I, I have a, a not very respectable answer to this question, um, <clears throat> which... We, we like cringe here. We've got a whole story <laughs> in, in the anthology about how awesome cringe is. Um, like, there, there are a lot of really amazing works of um, writing or cinema or even visual art um, in cyberpunk that have really influenced me over the years. But if we're talking about my biggest influence, probably... It was the first piece of cyberpunk media I ever experienced, which was um, when I was in like late grade school, um, all the people around me were collecting uh, Magic the Gathering cards and I didn't, um, I couldn't compete with them because they already had these huge collections and somebody stole all my Star Trek cards. So I got uh, Netrunner cards, which was this like <laughs> um, collectible card game that didn't make a big splash and was kind of abandoned by Wizards of the Coast after a while. Um, and I never really even learned how to play it. But, um, you know, being that age and having this this collection of all of these different cards that all little bits of lore and like really amazing art that was like kind of abstract it it wove together for me this whole kind of world where I was imagining the space between these different cards and their interactions and stuff um and it I don't know it, it really created something in my mind that was that was both like very heavily aesthetic like we talk about the <laughs> kind of degrading the genre um but was also really interesting to me to think about and fun and that I'm sure has steered uh, the way I think about cyberpunk ever since then. <laughs> I also have not the most highbrow answer possible to. Um, I, I love tabletop RPGs. They're one of my favorite versions of interactive media. And the thing that like inspired me in a lot of uh, cyberpunk was actually the Cyberpunk 2020 system, um, which deeply flawed, deeply flawed. But the thing that inspired me and keeps inspiring me is the cyber psychosis. They're the cis man's best attempt at writing dysphoria <laughs> while fundamentally misunderstanding both dysmorphia and dysphoria and going, what if your cell phone made you kill yourself like it doesn't but at the same time i think it's it's affected all writing in that in that space because it, it's a perfect example of if we're not gonna get to define this shit in the media landscape somebody else is gonna do it and they're gonna do it fucking wrong and <laughs> that and you know that it, it's also it's it's a great little pastiche of itself, but yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> that's I, that's a great answer. I feel like, um, at least for me, um, the or you know, I, I feel like I noticed you know in the Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven controversy, you know, where there was that in game transphobic advertisement. I feel like a lot of um, trans people saw that and were like. Oh hell no! I'm gonna write some some good cyberpunk. So I feel like sometimes out of uh, you can turn you know poisoned ground into into something fertile. Spite. Uh, no, spite is an amazing uh, writerly motivator. Uh, but um, in terms of uh, 
what's a piece of cyberpunk media. Um, uh, as Anne mentioned, there's the Matrix. Um, my answers might be a little boring. I like I was a Neuromancer um, by William Gibson. Um, then there's like a Ghost in the Shell um, in terms of the uh, the show, and I'm interested in how sort of cyberpunk media explores the uh, sort of the boundaries or breaks boundaries between like people and their technology and interfaces and uh, sort of um, writing past um, what those limitations might be in our present world. But I'm also interested in uh, looking particularly at uh, older cyberpunk media uh, to think about how like a lot of these technologies now have like very close analogs to in our sort of uh, modern day tech hellscape. Um, thinking of um, all the all the VR stuff. Um, thinking about uh, research that's being done at this very moment, or um, uh, about like uh, in the dream studies, so that maybe one day com companies will be able to advertise to you in your dreams or whatever. Um, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm interested in exploring those things in cyberpunk media. Mm. Yeah, talking about dreams, there's a great um, cyberpunk story uh, by a trans woman um, called um, How Could You Be So Cruel, Mr. Dawn? It's in Lightspeed. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's really good. It's by Violet Allen. Uh, you should go check it out if you're into like weird dream cyberpunk stuff. Um, but it's it's cool that you mentioned Neuromancer because I feel like Molly Millions in that is like heavily transfem coded in a way that maybe even William Gibson didn't quite realize. Um, I also recently watched um, uh, Hackers, which came out in 1995, and it was fascinating how the um, the the movie seems to use like trans femme aesthetics without acknowledging where it came from and i'm really curious about like the extent to which that was like the the chicken or the egg like which one inspired which um yeah and then i also want to um you know one one piece of inspiration for me is um uh is recent actually it's um frog kosarex collection um oleander grip um which is it's self-published it's only available on itch but it's some of the most like weird and inventive science fiction and cyberpunk i've ever read so if you want something that's like completely different from um what you've uh what you've read uh before like i highly recommend frog kosarek oleander grip um all right so next question um given cyberpunk's fixation on the human body as a subject how would you um approach crafting a progressive vision of transhumanism as opposed to the reac reactionary eugenicist adjacent strain that's a big part of the genre's history um i'll answer that one first i mean the like the thesis of this uh, anthology was that if I got a bunch of awesome trans film writers together, they would come up with stuff that was, um, they would naturally come up with stuff that was very cool and different uh, than some of that more, you know, reactionary, you know, like stuff like Altered Carbon, which had cool world building, but like is uh, very much a like dudely dude noir pastiche. Um, and you know, thankfully, like I was, I was blown away by the quality of work I got uh, in submissions. I'm, I'm curious if y'all have any thoughts. I, I think, yeah, the answer is in the anthology. Get fucking weird with it. Uh, the weirder cyberpunk gets, the further away from that shit that we get, because we get explorations that are explorations of dysphoria and 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 gender through fashion. Uh, we get explorations of Paradise Lost. We get like all of these amazing views of cyberpunk that aren't what we normally get to see. And it's so fucking cool. <laughs> I'm thinking also about uh, cyberpunk as critique, uh, cyberpunk as writing about uh, our world and the technologies emergent uh, near future or uh, sort of uh, what's already here, but in uh, future dressing uh, and, uh, and the criticisms of 
um, how that's uh, impacting our world. That um, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, my approach to this would be a uh, cyberpunk with your critical lens, maybe because I don't have um, enough positive ideas. Um, but yeah. And I, I think all you really have to do is is be as true as you can to the possibilities that cyberpunk presents and explores. I mean, uh, so much of our, our current social hierarchies are uh, the oppressions that we are, are part of or subject to or participate in. Uh, all of this stuff is so grounded in the body in so many different ways and what just about any kind of cyberpunk allows you to do is imagine ways that would fundamentally break the the ways in which we're grounded in our bodies now um and even like a slight modification to that even a slight change in the rules of how we're part of our bodies or how our bodies are socially constructed or or any of this stuff it creates lots and lots and lots of really interesting knock-on effects all of which have something interesting and i think insightful to say about um the world that we're living in now and like stuff like altered carbon is has lots of ways in which it's very imaginative but i think the the lost or missed opportunity is all the ways in which it doesn't fully get into just how weird that world would be um and every moment that you're able to sit down and really think through a new way in which it would be completely weird is a way in which you're you're really pushing the genre to its closer towards its um the realization of its possibilities yeah i i definitely um wrote my cyberpunk cheese heist novella the transitive property cheese of cheese out of spite about altered carbon about how unimaginative some of it was because you know we've got this future where uh you can upload your mind to arbitrary bodies but you know most of the bodies we see are just like ooh, how good can this body kill other people and you know we don't get a lot of the like really weird stuff that people now are doing um with their bodies you know we don't have like you know where were the furries and altered carbon um and um yeah you know so i i wanted to i wanted to explore uh some of that um all right one last so oh, uh so we've got uh interested in any perspectives on obscure or older trans femme cyberpunk authors um so i mentioned cameron reed uh whose fortunate fall came out in 1986 and was just re-released by tor um and it's 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 really good. I highly recommend it. Do y'all have any recommendations for um, older or obscure transfem cyberpunk? No worries if you can't think of anything. We can, I can come back to that, or you can put anything you think of in the chat. Um, and then last question: Do y'all have any advice for budding transfem authors looking to show their experience to cisgendered or otherwise uh, unthinking or ignorant readers? I think writing through metaphor uh, works really well um, in terms of sort of uh, metaphor, allegory, analogous experiences um, to uh, sort of uh, maybe even like sort of sneak in um, as a method of disrupting uh, uh, sort of that, that uh, ignorance, I guess. Yeah. Um, so like I got started writing about uh, with trans characters uh, drawing heavily from folk tales and drawing from um, like traditional Korean folk tales and the like, thinking about like uh, shapeshifter creatures and stuff like that. Um, even this story that um, is in the anthology right now is uh, drawing again on like Paradise Lost and uh, sort of uh, biblical mythology, Christian mythology. Uh, so there's there's entry points, yeah. I would honestly say um, 
don't be afraid to share your experience, it, even if directly without metaphor, on the basis of what you think is unique to you isn't. It will be experienced by others. Other people will, you have to trust that the reverberations will reach somebody else. And I think writing with that kind of confidence can be really like speaking for myself, it's, it's transformative. It, it can encourage you not just to put that part of yourself on the page, but also in your life, in your day to day. And so I, I, I think that is for me, what's worked the best for me for, for putting it there, not being afraid that, you know, there's a bunch of people that think they're cis and they're going to read your stories and go, oh, fuck, <laughs> and just kind of deal with that. And you get to do that. So never be afraid to put your exact lived experience on the page, too. I absolutely love Catherine and Petra's answers uh, to that question. Uh, and the only thing I have to add is that I, I recently experienced the agony and ecstasy of actually revising for reprint the the first story that I wrote uh, after I came out. So it's like a, a very baby trans story. Um, and I had this really strong impression when I was reading it of just like what a different headspace I was in at the time. Um, and how much that story for me was about kind of trying to explain myself to the world around me and and put forth like this is what my transition means to me. Um, this is what I like want you to understand. Um, and I think what's changed for me over the years between then and now is that I I don't really give a shit anymore whether people understand or not. Um, and I think that that has been uh, a, a liberatory change for me. And I guess <laughs> my my advice therefore is. Um, figure out what you want to express, um, but then also express it with the confidence of someone who, who can trust that, whether it's through a metaphor or not, some people who read it will get what you're saying. Um, and, and some people won't, and those people can think about it until they do, um, or they can just misunderstand and move on. <laughs> Yeah, one thing I was surprised by, um, I guess not surprised, but it made me happy. Um, I was talking to Reiki Aoki about uh, Light from Uncommon Stars, and she talked about how many um, cishet men would come up and talk about how meaningful that book uh, was to them, um, which I thought was actually really, like, sweet and awesome, you know, because it's a very trans book, but it's cool that it... it, it it, that so many cishet people like liked it and emphasized with it. It was nominated for the Hugo. Um, and then on the flip side of that, I think that it's it's very possible, um, you know, at least in our current moment, to um, to have your to have your work published and read primarily by a, a queer audience. There's enough queer readers out there that that's possible. One thing I love about Neon Hemlock, um, who published um, the novella and who published, um, or sorry, who published the anthology and who published my um, cyberpunk cheese heist novella is that um, they are dedicated to um, publishing stories written by queer people intended for a queer audience. They publish the kind of things that that they're like, feel like inter-community conversation. Um, certainly, you know, they also run Baffling Magazine and I've had a couple of stories published in baffling that I knew were just too trans to ever be published um, uh, anywhere else. And so I, I, you know, and there are other publishers out there like that, um, Little Puss Press. Um, I think uh, the Trans Feminine Review has a uh, an article about um, uh, trans forward small presses. So you should check that out if you're interested. But yeah, you know, I think that it's very much possible to both write transly for a cishet audience but it's also possible to write for a, a queer audience who will kind of naturally get what you're talking about
Um, so we're almost out of time. Um, just very quickly, what's one thing you hope people would take from your story? Uh, I think the, if there's one thing I would love for people to take from the story that I wrote, if they can, it's that um, there's there's always a path towards and being embodied the way that you want to be, um, or at least more like the way you want to be, um, even if it's not always obvious how you get there from the start. I think for mine, it's the engines of capitalism and imperialism will always find a way to try to sell you your identity. And it's important to guard against that and understand that what looks like an opportunity to be yourself might not end up with you being you at the end of it. I think for my story, it's about the uh, sort of the beauty, but also the dangers of total knowledge or desire to uh, sort of um, accumulate and analyze all this data um, for various technologies um, the, uh, and how that information can be uh, co-opted. Um, yeah. Well, thank you all um, so much for being with me here tonight. Um, just quickly, if you have anything, up, up, you know, any um, recently published or upcoming work you'd like to promote, mention that. And then also, where can we follow you online? Uh, I guess I'll start. Uh, so I'm Anne LeBlanc. You can find me on Blue Sky and also at AnneLeBlanc.com. I've got I edited embodied exegesis and also the transitive properties of cheese, which is a cyberpunk cheese heist. And you can get both of those from um, uh, Firestorm Books or from the publisher Neon Hemlock. Um, you can find me at katherinechem.net. Uh, I have a Twitter, but that website is burning in hell right now. So probably just my author website. Um, I am currently working on a dream novella that I'm sending chapters out um, that's uh, focused on a, a sort of mysterious study group that's meeting um, at the request of this missing doctor. Um, and they talk about the weird stuff that's happening in their dreams and why they're there. Uh, I am on Blue Sky. I finally got all the way off of the Hell site. Um, you can find me at, I think, Ellie underscore bangs, something like that. I also have a website, elbangs.com. Um, my big thing is this novel, which came out in 2021. It's about uh, collective consciousness and uh, a disastrous road trip across the shattered remains of the American Southwest under the looming specter of a final world war. Um, lots of it's really good. It's it's oh, one of the best things I've ever written about hive minds and apocalypses. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a bunch of short stories out you can find on my site. I'm always trying to publish uh, more novels, and that has been really tough because publishing is publishing. Um, but yeah. Uh, you can find all of my stuff. You can find me across all social media uh, at pre-apocalypse. Uh, I'm on Blue Sky. I'm on the Hell site, of course, and many other places. Um, as I do a lot of work and write a lot of fiction in zine form, you can find a lot of that on itch.io. But uh, the link that I've dropped in the chat right now is actually one of the best places to find everything, which is petraskelton.card.co. Um, I design a lot of games. Uh, not all of them are the best thing, but we're working through a bunch of game design ideas. So, uh, otherwise, yeah, uh, you can find my short stories just by looking up me, looking me up on social media or going to my site, uh, where it has links to everything. Um, yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you so much. This this evening has like brought me so much joy. Um, it's been fantastic. Uh, your readings were great, and I really do encourage everybody to pick up this book. Um, it's just full of pieces that absolutely will give you chills. Um, so, uh, and thank you uh, again for helping to to pull all of this together for us tonight. Um, I hope everybody has a, a fantastic rest of their their day. Thank you again so much for being here. Thank you so much for hosting us. I really appreciate it. This has been great. Take care, folks.